the next person to come up will be George Lakey. Um, just to introduce George, George has been an activist in a variety of movements his whole adult life. His first arrest was for a civil rights sit-in. His most recent was with Earthquaker Action Group's protest against mountaintop removal coal mining. Uh, he's led over 1,500 social change workshops on six continents, including being smuggled across the border into a guerrilla encampment in the Burmese jungle with student revolutionaries. Um, he's currently a visiting professor at Swarthmore College. He's also the author of this book, uh, The Sword That Heals, which uh, is not so much a book as it is a debate that he had uh, with Ward Churchill about uh, violence and nonviolence, and it is for sale out in the lobby. So if you're interested to pick it up after he speaks, take a look. Anyway, please welcome George. Hi, very pleased to be here. My focus this evening in this short amount of time that I have is on how to support the Occupy movement and the anti-capitalist movement to grow Nobody seems to dislike that. <laughs> to grow, become stronger, and also uh, to become more unified. And th for that, I think it would be useful to have uh, a strategy. Multiple strategies might be useful. But a strategy especially that would, uh, would tend to not only to grow the movement, but also to encourage people to become more unified. And one of the reasons I'm really pleased to be here tonight is because that's one purpose of your being here, is to look for ways that we can work together more effectively. Uh, there are a number of strategy tools that, that are available. I've, I've put up here a list of resources for strategy. Uh, it's not at all an exhaustive list, uh, but I'll continue to write my weekly column, putting more and more strategy tools out that I've used in multiple countries with student revolutionaries in Indonesia, with many people who've been trying to bring down their, their regimes. And as in, in order that, we have tools that we can use together I know there's a, a 19th century tradition of sending some brilliant person off to come up with a strategy and come back and say, here, comrades, is the strategy. But what I believe is that there is collective wisdom and that what we need is tools that support us to work together to develop our strategies. So one tool is this strategic framework that I put up here. I call it a framework rather than a strategy. It isn't a strategy, but it's a framework through which we can look at how movements can develop over time, become larger, become stronger, become more radical over time, in order that eventually they're able to overthrow the 1% and establish something way, way better. So let me just describe this step by step. A few of you do know this framework already, but may not have thought of it in terms of the goal of overthrowing capitalism and establishing something much, much better. And I, I'm very excited that even though this framework can be used for many goals, I think um, it's pretty exciting that we can have a room this size of people considering this kind of goal. So the first step is, uh, is cultural preparation. And that includes especially increased unity around the analysis of what's wrong and increased unity around a vision of what would be better and increased unity about a strategy that would enable us to be playing on the same team rather than mo mostly splitting. As you know, one of the challenges for the US politics historically has been a great tendency to split. <laughs> and, and at some point, it would be great to stop that, or at least to bring it down to some reasonable proportion. And so we need, uh, we, ne we need all three of those things. The analysis, in, in my estimation, in the Occupy movement, in the radical ecology movement, and so on, is really developing very rapidly. And a huge thing to Occupy's credit is that it put on the map the fact that there's class struggle. I know that Warren Buffett said it to the New York Times in 2006. However, a lot of people either didn't believe Warren Buffett or hoped he wasn't right. <laughs> <laughs> and forgot it as quickly as possible. But what Occupy did was put it front and center in American consciousness. And the fact that so many pundits writing, including people who disagree with class analysis, still have to make a bow 
to that analysis in the media is definite uh, expression of what a huge impact that's made. So analysis moving along nicely. Vision, not so much in my judgment. Maybe uh, others would disagree. But as far as I can tell, we haven't yet really quite projected a very clear picture of what, uh, if we don't have the 1% guiding our society and setting its direction, then what do we have? What would take its place? <laughs> and a problem about not having that is that it's very hard for to get folks who are in the middle wondering, well, we don't like what it is now, but we don't quite know about this bunch of people being locked into concrete by Kathy. We don't know about those people. It's a very, very reassuring for them to know that there's a vision that the movement is going toward. And uh, in my personal experience, my first time being arrested having been in the Civil Rights Movement, it was hugely reassuring to have uh, Dr. King and others, SNCC and so on, uh, describing themselves as having a freedom movement. And freedom, well, you know, it's hard to knock freedom, right, in our country. Hey, freedom, well, that sounds pretty good. And so, there, there, and there, there, were, uh, there was enough meaning to that, enough significance to that, so the people like my dad, working class, blue collar worker, who on the one hand was anti-racist and on the other hand was very uh, scared about insecurity, having been a depression child, was constantly being reassured by the civil rights movement that radical change or even substantial change would not be to his disbenefit. So a vision can be enormously important. One reason why I wrote the article uh, about Norwegians and Swedes uh, breaking the political power of the 1%, which has gotten a viral uh, impact around the world, even translated into Arabic by the Yemenis who say, hey, we have a 1% over here too. Uh, one reason I wrote that article was because I was racking my brain for an example of some society on earth that is actually done in the 1%. Not done in in the sense of extinguished it, but so pushed back its political power that the 1% does not dominate and control either Norway or Sweden. And so I wrote that article describing how that was done and what some of the outcome was. I wish I had time to go into that specifically, but all I have to say is free education, free higher education, anyone? And I think a lot of hands would be raised with great interest. Um, if, if you want to, questions and answers, we can go into that. But w the feedback that I've gotten, this is my main point, the feedback that I've gotten from that article from all over the world is so many people excited. You mean somebody's done it? We thought this was this wild thing, so we might as well be romantics and fuck stuff up and you know, blah, 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 because tomorrow we die. You know, something like that. <laughs> not knowing, not knowing that there have been human beings, that is who share a DNA, you know, I mean the human the human species has actually accomplished enormous changes with regard to overthrowing the one percent. And the, and therefore we're talking in real world terms. We, we, can be, we can feel grounded, even though it's far from clear how to do that exactly in the US. At least we know we're not talking about something that's simply somebody's imagination. Strategy is the third thing that we need to develop in this cultural preparation stage. And so you see I'm actually think, placing Occupy in this stage because I think there's so much to be done about it. And that's what we're doing here tonight. The other thing I would say, though, is that it's very important to note, well, no, I won't say that now because I'm in a rush, but I will make the other point which is already written up here, which is uh, maybe particularly important to do in this society, there are other societies that have this problem also, of working on the oppressions that divide us. Because one reason why the Norwegians and Swedes were able to get so much farther than we were was because their 1% didn't have racial, a racial divide to keep people apart. Um, and, and they used gender to, and they used other things, religion and so on, but they weren't as, it wasn't as easy for the 1% to maintain dominance through division as it is for the US, which has done that historically and is doing it right now. And so we need to address that in order to get the breadth of movement that we need. 
I am assuming we need a huge, a huge movement. Am, am, I, am I with you on this? I mean, a couple hundred thousand people is not going to do it. A couple million people is not going to do it in our society. We're going to need a very, very big movement because it's only people power in the last, last analysis that can counter money power. We're not going to, even sharing our piggy banks, going to come up with the money power. So we'd better do it with the people power, and that means a mass movement. So stage two, then, is organizing that mass movement. Well, uh, I, I won't say much about that because I think that's one of the ways that Occupy has really distinguished itself by putting on the American social change agenda the importance of, re of, of a new understanding of leadership. That instead of the old hierarchical pattern of putting somebody in charge and directing the troops, that the, the, the birth of the General Assembly and Spokes Councils and these other innovations are on the road toward the, pre the prefigurative politics that actually give people more confidence that the, the vision will be realized, that it won't be one of those envisions out there, a vision to entrance, and then there's the party that takes it <laughs> and runs that next society, which that's been done, right? We don't want to do that. Um, so prefigurative politics is itself enormously reassuring to those tens of millions, and I believe there are tens of millions of Americans who are watching closely, tens of millions who are angry with the 1%, tens of millions who are ready for something different and are watching us, but to convince them to act, it's going to require a lot of reassurance. A lot of people have been scammed in our country, right? Maybe we're the scammers this time. How does anybody know? So we need to prove ourselves in one way is through the organizational forms. And also, another way is how much we're successful at going outside our bubble. The downside of prefigurative, and I know as one of the founders of Movement for New Society, I can testify to this. Laughter here from the front of a colleague <laughs> of mine. Uh, the downside of prefigurative uh, politics is the unwitting, unexpected, or unconscious creating of bubbles, which gets people into a, a state of righteous euphoria, but <laughs> does not reach out to the broad uh, numbers of people who need to be reached out for. So that's another thing that we need to tackle in stage two. One reason to do those two stages first before confrontation, although you, Occupy has gotten very far with confrontation up till now. Uh, but one reason why more of that would be useful prior to confrontation is confrontation time is when people get scared. Nobody's just green. <laughs> mm. Okay, so confrontation time is a time when people get scared and when it's very good to have a clear analysis and <laughs> vision and strategy and it's very useful to have solidarity because the best known antidote to fear is solidarity, it's human association, it's community, it's connection. And the more of that is established before major repression comes on our movement, the better. We've not had major repression on this movement. Um, one reason why I'm grateful that I had the experience in the civil rights movement that I did is that the civil rights movement knew what repression was. The civil rights movement knew what it was like. SNCC went into Mississippi, 1961. Ku Klux Klan was in charge, local law enforcement. There was nobody there to protect the SNCC people. The only way, according to Bob Moses, who told me this personally, uh, at uh, Mississippi summertime where I was a trainer. The only way that, that the SNCC people survived as well as they did was because nobody had a gun in their freedom houses and everybody knew that. And that put enormous pressure. I can go more into the, the sophisticated strategy that was involved here. But that put enormous pressure on the KKK not to wipe out SNCC, which they otherwise, of course, were itching completely itching to do. But the main reason I refer to this is not so much the strategy in dealing with repression. That's a long subject, and I'm writing pretty much weekly columns on that. But in order to <coughs> remind you, in case you're tempted to complain about the repression that is being so far dealt out to Occupy, that it's nothing compared with what the civil rights movement not only experienced, but grew as a result of, now, of course, Occupy also has the experience of police hit us, we grow, police hit us. That's happened in Portland, happened in Oakland, happened in New York City, right? We know there's this thing called the paradox of repression. The violence on us, then we grow. 
That's one of the major ways of growing. Gandhi, and if you haven't seen the Gandhi film lately, check it out. At one point he's saying, well, the duty of a civil resistor is to confront in such a way as to bring the truth, <laughs> the truth to bear, to bring the reality to bear. That is one of the dynamics that we work with, and there's no escaping that. But because that's scary, then it's very good to have those first two stages. I wish I had time, but maybe in question time, uh, I can get into this debate that's going on right now between mass actions like G8 and conventions as compared with campaigns. I'll just say, in order to provoke some of you maybe, that I think mass actions are definitely the wrong road for, uh, for Occupy to go in. Same old, same old. No reason based on empirical reality to think that it's going to advance us to grow and to deepen and lots of uh, disadvantages to that. Uh, whereas campaigns, I think, have enormous promise in terms of growing the movement. But you might want to get into that at controversy time. How am I doing? I think you're out of time. I'm out of time. Okay, well, oh, what a contradiction. I'm out of time and I'm doing good. Okay, that sounds like some movements I've been part of. Out of time, but doing good. Oh, well, okay, let me just say that the point of stage three, the point of confrontation is to grow the movement to the point where there can be mass non-cooperation. Mass, I mean mass. I mean like, like, uh, Ma yeah, yeah, you know, mass on corporations, like a general strike that actually stops a city from operating. It's mass on corporation, Birmingham, Alabama in 1963. Dislocating cities not, uh, through the non-cooperation of people, people not going to work, people not running the trolleys and all the rest. Mass on corporation is a very, very important stage. We saw it in Egypt. We saw it recently, right? We saw it in Tunisia, so I don't have to go into it more, except to emphasize that you can't expect it to come out of nowhere. You can't call for mass non-cooperation and everybody say, oh, okay, George, uh, you know, I was planning to go to the dentist tomorrow, but I'll, uh, you know. No, 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 no. It takes stage three to trigger mass non-cooperation. And then if we get mass non-cooperation, it's demonstrated abundantly in our database over and over ago, dozens of cases in which mass non-cooperation created a power vacuum that brought down a dictatorial regime, that brought down a military-backed government. But the question then is, what takes its place? That's what the Egyptians are working on right now. What takes its place? That's what we need to be ready for. And as you'll see from that red line on the right, of what I believe is that the prefigurative part in stage two can play a vital role in that planting the seeds for a stage five that will be a new society, that will be highly democratic, that will be egalitarian, that will be participative. Thank you very much. <laughs>